And I'm really delighted to be able to kick off our proceedings today uh, with a keynote speech from Professor Jonathan Zittrain. Um, it is, I suppose, effectively actually his inaugural speech on behalf of the OII. He's just joined us this month as the new Professor of Internet Governance and Regulation. Jonathan helped to establish the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law School. And I mean, I think most people would agree who've heard him speak. He's a truly original thinker, an excellent speaker, uh, and an immensely talented academic. I'm really pleased to have him at the OII. He also unusually, and I think one of the reasons why we're keen to have him here at this conference, combines both impressive technical understanding of the internet with very rigorous legal training, and I'm aware that's an unusual combination of skills. So we expect him to have a significant impact on the research agenda, not just of the OII, but we also think internet-related research in the UK. So we're delighted to welcome him both to our department and to this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. It's Jonathan Zittrain. So good morning. I'm going to try pressing the two button and see what happens. Better? Those of, you who are, those of you who are sleeping can now sleep in peace. Let's try this. So uh, good morning. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Bill. I'm delighted uh, to be here and to meet a bunch of new people and to see so many friends as well uh, in the audience. I can only echo Bill's view. It's uh, just an amazing institution here. Uh, the vice chancellor seems to be doing a terrific job. Of course, I'm a relatively recent arrival here. I got here on. Uh, Tuesday, but so far it seems like a really well-run uh, place, and I'm just delighted uh, to be a part of it. So uh, I can only agree with the sentiment expressed so far that we have in our hands a double-edged sword, something that we know has been doing terrific things, but also has been creating lots of problems. And in a sense, when I think about the different audiences thinking about Internet policy, one audience is the audience that only looks primarily at the good stuff and simply wants to defend it against all constriction and restraint. And uh, the other side typically focuses on the evils and is looking for ways to prevent them. And I want to, uh, in the minutes I have here, give a sense of how to thread a needle of trying to acknowledge genuinely the evils that are out there and really try to take steps that I believe will have to be fundamental steps, not steps around the edges, to address them without ruining the truly precious aspects of the internet that we, I think, somewhat serendipitously have found ourselves in a position to enjoy. Um, in North Korea, radios, by law, must be tuned to one of only four stations. This law is enforced by the radios themselves. You can't physically adjust the radio to be at any of these four, other than these four stations, which are, you know, King Jong Il 1, King Jong Il 2, <laughs> Kim Il Sung 1, and Kim Il Sung 2. And uh, this is somebody in South Korea actually with a solar powered radio, which can be tuned to a spectrum of stations. And in fact, there is a project by which these radios are attached to helium balloons and sent across the demilitarized zone to land where they might so that people in North Korea can get their hands on technology over which they have some control. So I just want to begin by thinking about that and thinking about a piece of technology in the earlier history in the West that shared some characteristics with those radios and the way in which that technology was eclipsed by a very different technology, what I call a generative technology that is that of the internet and significantly, why it's times two there, of the PCs that are attached to the internet. So uh, first, the early technology, the one that isn't so adjustable. The Frieden Flexerwriter, great example of this technology. One of the first word processors, it looked a lot like a royal typewriter, but had space along the left there for a tape to go through so that as you typed, you would make indentations in the tape and thereby produce a record of what you had typed, which you could then feed back through the flexor writer in order to regenerate what you had typed. And by the simple act of cutting and pasting, you could do mail merge. 
more easily than you can do it today. So um, <laughs> that is a dedicated word processor. Um, it went through iterations as technology changed. Here's a vintage 60s era Frieden flexor writer, but it still knew its nature. It wasn't going to do anything for the most part but word process and perhaps generate tape that could be used uh, to do punch cards for computer software. That appliance-sized model of building technology started to evolve in the consumer landscape in the 1980s, when this gentleman leading the charge, Bill Gates, here shown in one of his more interesting moments, uh, <laughs> having been arrested in Albuquerque, New Mexico on a traffic stop in 1977, still bears that smile that says, I'm going to own you all someday. <laughs> but he led the charge to take this rather prosaic looking device and get it into households. And this is a device that is totally different from the Frieden Flexor Writer because it will run anything ending in .exe. You hand the PC a piece of software and it will run it. And it doesn't matter if the software is a golf game or in one of the uh, biggest costs to business worldwide, Solitaire, or a word processor, or you name it, this thing will run it. And its architecture, while it dates itself in this particular picture to the mid-90s, because you can see it has the 66 megahertz light on with a button next to it, whereby you can downshift it to 33 megahertz if you want to give the hamsters inside a rest, this thing has not significantly changed in its architecture since the mid-1990s. It's a general purpose computing device that runs stuff ending in .exe. And of course, for the Macintosh, the equivalent of .nothing, but somehow it knows when you double click it, it's an application, that kind of thing. That architecture meant that you could have third parties without the resources of a Microsoft writing all sorts of software, literally off-the-shelf software. They needed no privity whatsoever with Microsoft, with Apple, with the other operating system or hardware vendors in order to produce in the world software that consumers could adopt and use, and they could do so building on the backs of those operating systems so that the most uninteresting but still necessary functions were already taken care of by the OS leaving it to the programmers to be as creative as possible with the time and resources they had in building different applications on those OSs, many of them pictured here. Now, when you move to the Internet, when you take the PC, which, of course, until not all that long ago was just standing alone, you'd go to the store or get through the mail your software, you put it on the Internet, and suddenly you can have thousands and thousands of pieces of software written, not just by companies that are small, but by individuals or by distributed groups of people who've never met each other, passing the software around in fragments, making it better or worse or at least different, the internet has enabled that kind of project to take place. Here at sourceforge.net where people share their source code, you can see tens of thousands of projects, tens of thousands of registered users all contributing to an explosion of different functionality for the generic boxes that so many of us have in front of us, even at this very instance. Now, that's one form of generative technology. That's the box in front of us. It is mirrored, again, more by, I say, coincidence than by any grand design or certainly by any engineering necessity by the Internet itself. Uh, it's, uh, three of its principal founders are pictured uh, here, Postel, Crocker, and Cerf, uh, for Newsweek's 25th anniversary retrospective of the Internet. And uh, you can see they have their own network here built out of zucchini and uh, tin cans, although I think it doesn't actually function because it's ear to ear and mouth to mouth. Um, I hope an inside joke rather than the fact that the three principal engineers of the Internet don't know how to build one out of tin cans. Um, <laughs> but illustrating the fact that in internet architecture, first, you can build a network out of just about anything, and if you can just bring it to any node of the existing internet, it is welcome to join that network. And second, at the top, you can run any application over it. That's the expectation 
of the protocol design of the internet. Now, it's so embedded, it's almost like breathing, but it didn't have to be that way. Some of you may remember CompuServe, or MCI Mail, or the source, or Minitel, or America Online in its older form. I won't say which was the better form. Um, but these were proprietary networks, not at all like this. Those were networks where if you wanted to ship data for a particular application over the network, you needed the central acquiescence, coding facility, et cetera, of the network administrators. You couldn't just decide to invent email and then implement it over a commoditized pipe of data. Instead, you had to get the CompuServe people to say, yeah, email or CB simulator or bulletin boards or online gaming is a good idea. We'll partner with you. We'll take a chunk of that uh, business, and away we go. And I think the fact that those proprietary networks, which many of us at the time thought was only a question of which proprietary network would become the one that would dominate, rather than would the internet trump them all, it was the fact that those networks were limited that I feel made the internet in a position to actually trounce them all because it was so much more useful and so much less constrained in what somebody that wakes up on Tuesday and has a good idea can implement worldwide by Thursday. So the principles of the people like John Postel and Vint Cerf uh, who were building internet protocols in academia, in the university, were relatively open principles. They weren't out to proprietize what they were doing. And as a result, they had such rules as keep it really simple. We're not going to try to keep adding features to this network. Instead, we're going to just make it work really well doing a very basic thing and ask that any other features be implemented on those generative PCs out there rather than in the network itself. Also, that you should keep it open, that growth could come from anywhere, so you shouldn't presume to know what the network will be used for. And you can let anybody that has an Ethernet dongle or a radio wave plug in, start sending data to somebody else on the network, and away they go. As far as doing the protocols, technical meritocracy, we gather in a room sometimes to come to consensus. We hum instead of vote, because we reject voting. That sounds too political and we just work the issues through until somebody either gets so tired they say, fine, you win, or we all come to technical consensus as to what the best way to make the network work is. In an implementation, we will have two principal assumptions. One, that people are reasonable, and two, that people are nice. And with those kinds of assumptions, we can do things like if we need a database of identity on the network, well, the CompuServe Minitel way of doing it is we'll have a centralized database. And people have to check into the database. And uh, once they're in the database, they authenticate themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Right? That's enough to slow down your network by 10 years trying to build that in. They say, no, the best database is distributed. Because who better than you knows who you are? <laughs> so you should just be able to walk up to an email and say to your email client, I am george at whitehouse.gov. And the email, OK, you're george at whitehouse.gov. That's the kind of thinking that made the internet so powerful, so flexible, so readily deployed, but assumptions of which are, shall we say, a bit uh, outdated, given the way that the internet has become as ubiquitous as it is. There are, to be sure, no one should be surprised by this, a few bad apples among us that uh, these assumptions now get sorely tested. Even in the early 90s, there was concern about whether these sorts of assumptions in the network they produced could actually work. IBM is famously quoted in 1992 as having said, you can't build a corporate network out of TCP IP. I mean, it doesn't have quality of service. How can you even guarantee that the packets are getting there? You need IBM networks to make your corporate environment sing. And uh, I have a bee here because some of the IETF say that their mascot should be the bee, because I'm sure this is apocryphal. Uh, but if you give an aerodynamic engineer who otherwise just fell off the turnip truck uh, the diagram for a bee, he or she will conclude that the wingspan to fur ratio is clear, that there's no way this thing can fly. And then, of course, the bee flies. So the IETF people say, yes, we're the bee. You can tell us up and down why our network won't work. In fact, you can send us an email and tell us why the network doesn't work, and we'll write back. So that's the kind of seriousness with which the IETF critics have taken 
some of the most incisive commentaries about the way their networks work. Now, because of this network, backed up by a generative PC hooked up to it, we have seen an amazing proliferation of good and fascinating stuff out there. You're probably familiar with many of these things. Oh My News, one of the most popular newspapers in South Korea right now, written by citizen journalists who get paid on a one-off basis by professional editors who then put out a newspaper. Is it of good quality? I don't know. I urge you to read it and see. Wikipedia, many people familiar with Wikipedia, right? How many people have actually edited Wikipedia entries here? How many are editing one right now? <laughs> okay, good. I thought Vicky's commentary about uh, the press will be identified, say if you want to be off the record, right? We know we're in an era of blogging now. If you say you want it off the record, it means that the blogger will report that you wanted it off the record, <laughs> which might or might not help you if you're trying to keep something under wraps. So um, let me just dwell for one second on Wikipedia, because the fact that somebody named Jimbo could invent a website and apply a functionality to it by which anybody in the world at any time can create a new entry or edit an old one at any time is clearly a recipe for lunacy. It's clearly not going to produce a decent encyclopedia. And in fact, the bee flies. If you go to the Wikipedia, you can pick your language and you will see amazing entries from the goofy about the umlaut over heavy metal band names you can watch how that entry about that umlaut developed to the deadly serious. Here's the entry on Rachel Corey. I don't know how many people have heard of Rachel Corey. She was protesting in the West Bank, an American citizen, uh, protesting against Israeli uh, bulldozing of homes there, and was struck and killed by a bulldozer. This is the entry about her, and it is incredibly thorough. You will never see an entry uh, for her in Encyclopedia Britannica. The one you'll see here not only has a discussion page where you can see people who see shades of ideology on one side or the other fight it out, but you'll see here data about how it happened, what happened, who she was. Here she is burning an American flag in protest, one of the photos you don't often see in the mainstream media discussing Rachel Corey, along with a big discussion about whether there should be a photo of her burning an American flag on this entry. An incredible instrumentality and again, one that seems to represent some of the best at the moment that the internet has to offer. And of course, aside from just information, to be sure, we also have creativity. Most of us which an old, with an old Etch-a-Sketch. Is Etch-a-Sketch popular here? Yeah? Is anybody using Etch-a-Sketch right now? <laughs> just wondering. So Etch-a-Sketch, this is what most of us are capable of doing with it. Um, some can do a little bit better than that. Some are just like, my God, where did you come from in order to be able to do something as detailed as that? The fact of having generative capacity in our PCs to let us be incredibly creative, to mold the work of others into still better or at least different works, that is what we're now starting to hit in the mainstream PC and internet revolution. That is an incredible instrumentality. This is the kind of thing that lets some guy in Europe come up with the crazy frog Axel F ringtone, which, as you may have heard, was at the top of the pop charts. The number one <laughs> single was this. Now, I think the record companies have a lot to worry about, about the internet. <laughs> this is what they have most to worry about, right? This is not a copyright infringement problem. This is a creativity deficit problem that they are now having to, to worry about, given that there is now competition out there in the form of something as um, preposterous as this. Uh, and the fact, I don't know how many of you have been to podcasting recently. Podcasting apparently invented in large part at the Berkman Center. Who knew? I mean, I guess it was under my watch, but I, nobody asked me for permission. And podcasting is the thing now taken up by iTunes by which anybody can just sit with a microphone, broadcast to the world, and if you go on to your little iTunes store, here are two Harry Potter podcasts, neither of which is authorized by J.K. Rowling. And uh, in fact, here's four Potter casts and various people making their names as now new radio personalities without any intermediaries at all. All right, so I've now been the cyber utopian. I realize we don't have that much time. So let's cut to the problem. What's the problem? Well, the problem is a generative net architecture. The great thing is also exactly the problem. Three aspects to it at least. Aspect number A, let's have A stand for anarchy. The fact is there have been lots of stuff that consumers like 
that powers that be have reason not to, such as Napster in its first incarnation. Copyright infringement, things like that. These are problems that the powers that be really want to see solved in some way. Here in Britain, the Patent Office issued a report trying to get people to think differently, especially as kids, about copyright so that they will respect it. My favorite recommendation of this report is that school children should recognize their own creativity by including the copyright symbol on their coursework. <laughs> Perhaps saying that anything lower than an A is a derivative work, I don't know, but uh, unauthorized derivative work. Um, but this is one battle that is clearly shaping things to come, and it doesn't just extend to students, it extends to teachers as well. Here is a suggested thing somebody like me might say before giving a lecture in order to give notice that the information I'm imparting shouldn't be exploited in any commercial way. I'm just telling you useless things, or if they're useful, you can't use them kind of thing without my further permission. Um, B, let B stand for billionaires. The dynamics financially of the internet are starting to shift away from the days where it made sense to build a generative platform, even in a dot-com model, and see what others could bring to it. Because after all, in the early days, Bill Gates could sell more operating systems if lots of software producers were out there writing software that made the OS for which was necessary for it more useful. He has grown up, as have his counterparts, and it may not be, now that we have killer apps and we know what they are, as sensible for them to only build operating systems. They are now in the business of building applications, and they'd rather have you use their applications than third-party ones. So the commercial forces auguring for keeping generativity open are starting to reduce as we come to know. We have less uncertainty about what consumers want for ultimate applications. This is another force pushing the internet in a closed, possibly more secure, but more closed direction. Basically enabling the locking up of content in ways that did not seem possible before. So uh, C, let C stand for consumer. Because so far, the biggest block towards closing off an open internet or an open PC has been the consumer himself or herself. It's the consumer who said, hey, I like this stuff. Leave me alone. I think the consumer's bellwether, as a bellwether, is switching in the other direction. And here is why. Cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a problem. It is a problem. There are millions and millions of PCs out there that can, in fact, and are, can be, and are compromised by worms and viruses. Now, here's the bizarre thing. These worms and viruses don't do anything. The worst these viruses deal out when they infect 40, 50, 60 percent of the PCs at any one time in the world are, one, they make more viruses, at which point you say, well, great, they make more viruses. It's like people keep introducing people, but where's the keynote? Sorry. Um, <laughs> or it is saying uh, uh, that we want it to do spam. We'll have your computer get infected, become a zombie for the purposes of redirecting it to do spam, but we don't want to disturb you while your computer is spamming others, so we'll still let you do your other functionality. It's just like while you're not busy, that your computer is busily working for others doing evil things. So far, that's not turning the consumers around, but there is no reason that we won't at some point soon have a virus that is designed maliciously to infect that 60% and then say, erase the hard drive. Once the computer is infected, there is nothing stopping that single line from being imparted into the code except the forbearance of the hacker. And that is an odd thing to rely on going forward for our cyber security. I have the cap and crunch bosun's whistle here because it so beautifully illustrates the fundamental architectural problem. This was a whistle from a box of cereal in the early 1970s, whereby in the United States, if you blew through the whistle covering one of the holes, you could, into your telephone, get free long distance calling because it was exactly the tone that signaled an idle line to AT&T. AT&T learned their lesson, no longer can you through any sound make a change in the system. That's bandwidth now independent. It's an out of band signal. The internet today is still at this level of vulnerability. 
the very pathways that convey instant messages, that convey emails, that convey web pages and clicks back and forth, are the channels that convey executable code. And that's the way we want it. It's also the exact vulnerability that AT&T was able to solve that we now face. As we surf, we never know if we click on something, is it data or is it executable? The answer often is yes. And that's where we get into cybersecurity problems. So if that's the major problem, how can we solve it? Because it's the consumer flip that's really going to change the dynamics here. One solution is to have more alert users. Just have them be more on guard about not having their computers get compromised. So for example, here at Harvard, uh, there's an email that goes out. You've probably seen emails like this saying, lately there's been an insurgence of fraudulent emails at the law school. And uh, this is my favorite part. Be weary of emails that have misspellings, poor <laughs> grammar, or odd characters. Now, I don't know about you, but I am totally weary of these emails. But I mean, this totally represents it, doesn't it, right? Whom do you trust? You can't even trust this email because obviously it was written by an nincompoop. So you look at the strategy to secure cyberspace in the United States from 2003. It tells us there's a big problem. What does it say we should do about it? Let's create an information sharing and advisory com commission. Here it is right here, the ISAC. There is either Steve Case or Jack Bauer. I don't do you watch. I can't tell which one it is, but it's a big room full of monitors where they all sit around and say, yep, there are viruses. And if there's a terrible virus, say, yep, there's a terrible virus. Should we tell anybody? We can't. The email's down. All right? That's so far the response of the governments around the world. And bless them, there's not a lot they can do because this architecture is so distributed. That means that security has had to come down to the individual PC and to be the choice of the individual user. This is not tenable. Solution A, not tenable. Why? Well, I was at Fordham recently, had to give a talk, wanted to get on the wireless network, needed a password, asked the person next to me, got the password, got onto the network, but immediately was told I had to run the smart enforcer. I don't know what it is, but it was 30 megabytes. I download and run the smart enforcer. The first thing the smart enforcer tells me to do is to install Symantec antivirus. All right, I hate this program. Not, no offense to Symantec. Are they a sponsor? No, OK, good. Um, but semantic antivirus, fine, fine. I run stupid semantic antivirus. No, no, you didn't update your virus definition. OK, I go update the virus definitions. Now I'm ready to surf the internet. What is the first thing semantic antivirus tells me I have to do? Well, it tells me that Smart Enforcer is trying to access the internet, and I should block it. <laughs> this is not a good way when the Pinkertons start fighting each other on your machine. You know that this is not a tenable model as a user to know what you're supposed to do. You get a box like this from XP Service Pack 2, you're trying to run Merck 616.exe. What do you want to do? <laughs> now, you have to be 100% right. If you once say, well, go ahead and run it, and you're wrong, it could be all over. And if you say, don't run it, and you've set out your whole Friday night to enjoy Merck 616, <laughs> now you've got nothing. You've got 24. So this is not a way to solve the problem. All right, another possible solution. Let's make the PCs themselves more alert. Put the user out of the equation. So an example of that would be automatic update. Let Microsoft every night, and right, every night is just so 2005, right? Soon it'll be every hour. And then like a good Patriot missile battery, it'll be every nanosecond. Microsoft will be watching my system, or fill in the blank, Apple or whoever, to decide whether or not it's up to no good. And if it's up to no good in its own judgment, it will do the blocking for you. Try turning off automatic updates in Service Pack 2 and see how often you are hectored to turn automatic updates back on. It's going from not required to optional to highly suggested to you must run this kind of thing. That will lead us to a point where you can't just run any old EXE because it won't be approved by the powers that be. You'll have the powers that be say, well, you want to run a .exe, come to Microsoft. Get us to sign off on your, dri on your uh, driver or on your software. Pay us a small fee, and we'll get back to you in six months with whether your application has been accepted or denied. Now, is that a good solution? I'm not so happy with that. But I can understand why consumers would beg for it. Because after one of these infections where the hard drive gets erased, inconveniencing you rather than just other people with your spam, you're going to be wanting that sort of thing. So more alert PCs will lead to more limited PCs. And that is the end of 
chapter one of the history of the generative internet. And it's an end that I lament. I see so much that is still to come, not just that has happened, that I would hate to lose as we move to a more appliance-sized model of consumer objects. The TiVo uh, is a great example of somebody who has a PC inside, but you only run it with something like this. It's an appliance, and it doesn't come down with viruses. On the other hand, it can also get updated rather easily. Here's the company's plans so that when you're skipping commercials with your di digital video recorder, you're seeing commercials offered by TiVo. <laughs> they haven't yet said whether there'll be a commercial skip, commercial skip, and whether they'll show commercials during that. <laughs> Set-top boxes, uh, Vonage and Skype built into boxes uh, like this. A whole range of consumer objects with which we interact with the internet that are appliances. They are the old school rather than the new generative PC. I occasionally to see how well Blackberries are doing doing Google image search. This is from last year. As you can see, it's half Blackberries and half Blackberries. As you might guess last week, the Blackberries, there's just one Blackberry hanging on <laughs> and the other Blackberries. And somehow, is that a uh, PSP sneaking in there when you type Blackberry? I don't know. So all of these things, including our cell phones, managed gatekeepers, the old school, the thing that the internet engineers sneered at as, while you're busy trying to redesign everything, we're just going to make it work and keep it simple. This is the problem. It's also the solution if what you want is a good cup of coffee, mm -hmm. right? You would not want your coffee to be made by a PC because if a bug gets in it, who knows what would end up in your coffee. But similarly, you wouldn't ask your coffee maker to do anything different in its realm than what a flexor writer does in its realm. So is there any solution that can help us here? Well, maybe it's time for a slightly more alert internet. Now, you have to understand, this is anathema to the internet engineers. Their whole point is keep it simple, keep it open, don't filter in the middle. They've written papers dating back to 1983 pointing out how you want to have an open protocol and open implementation. Don't let the middle worry about stuff. The endpoint should. But I think there may be some room for the middle to notice, for instance, when a computer has been turned into a zombie and to say, if it's a zombie, don't let it on the internet. Block it. And that can actually end up helping the internet at large and even ultimately the consumer, even as it's not very pleasant for the ISP to have to take the time to handhold the consumer through fixing his or her PC. There's a reason why ISPs don't want to do this, but it might actually be one of the best ways to take pressure off of problem C, the cyber security <laughs> problem. And finally, let's separate the internet ethos from the internet protocols and architectures themselves. The ethos by which people can come together and actually try to answer that question, which right now, if you click on it, it says, only run software that you can trust. Start to try to answer that question seriously. All the energy right now that's going into what we call internet governance, fighting over whether there'll be domain names ending in .xxx. I mean, let me be the first to say, I don't care. I don't think domain names are necessarily the future of internet governance. Leave Nominet alone. Let Nominet do what it wants with the domain names, I say, for the most part. We're already letting Google do what it wants with search, right? I mean, it's, what's the difference? We have more pressing collective internet governance questions in front of us that have to do with identifying and establishing reputations for the authors of software and helping consumers in a meaningful, non-monopolized way know what they should and shouldn't run with their PCs. If we license our cosmetologists, do they license cosmetologists here in the UK? Really? I think they do, right? You license everything here. Um, then surely we can have something that approaches having to establish your credibility as a software author before lots of consumers will rush to run your stuff. This is a computer from Lenovo, which has a little switch on the keyboard, which is designed to let multiple family members easily, physically switch among their accounts. You could see this switch being deployed to say, I'd like to run my computer in coffee maker mode. I only want to run the most secure, most cleared stuff. I realize it'll be boring, but by the way, this computer is a cash register, so let's leave it in 
coffee maker mode. But then with a the flick of the switch, you know what? I'm ready to go off-roading. Put it into four-wheel drive. I'm going to take some risks. Let's see what happens. And if anything goes wrong, I'll switch it back to safe mode. These are the kinds of things we can start to do creatively to build architectures that really try to balance the desire to tinker, to let people get in there and share their fruits with the rest of us with the knowledge that there are truly evils out there that we want to guard against and build against. So splitting between the zip code uh, back home at uh, uh, what used to be home at uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, MIT over here, they can hack any technology. They don't care about the future. They're going to do whatever they want. They'll build robots. And 02138, Harvard Square, they don't care about the technological future. They just read books. So what's it to them? In the middle is the rest of us. And we have to figure out what our biggest priorities are. Does consumer really cover all the things we might want to be doing, or are some of these things hinting at, say, creator as part of our opportunity? So what is our central challenge? I say it is to preserve the benefits of generativity, to realize not just the greatness of the internet, but the architectural foundations from which it springs, both the network foundations and the PC foundations, while combating the evils it permits. And this is a message back to the 02139ers. There are evils out there. They really do have to be taken seriously because the stakes are increasing. If the internet went down in 1988 or 87, as it did with the first widespread worm, the Morris worm, all right, you know, the internet goes down. That was interesting. We'll learn from it. It's a teachable moment. If the internet goes down now, chronically, and data is compromised, and people are hurt, it's no longer, well, that's the way it works. This is an instrumentality that is reaching maturity. And we have to have some boundaries in it that recognize that. That's the needle uh, we have to thread. Thank you very much.